So the fundamental entities in the world are quarks and these electron-like things called leptons. And I don't know, the, the people at the Department of Energy gave me this slide. I don't know if that means anything to you at all, but anyway, there, there's, there's, there's different types of them. Uh, and and you know, the, the great thing about when you're, when you're a physicist and you, you discover a new thing, you, you, know, you have the right to give it a funny name, and so they, they get lots of funny names, strange quarks and top quarks and charm quarks, etc. The point being, though, that these are, as far as we know, the fundamental things that the world is made of. So here's, here's how, how do we build a universe out of those things? Well, first we make nucleons, protons and neutrons, and they're made of quarks. So there's, there's my proton and my neutron. And I, I, I put them together to make a nucleus, and then I, I grab an electron, and it goes around, and I make myself an atom, and then I just multiply that by billions and billions and billions and billions, and I end up with, with the fat, okay? <laughs> So the point, the point is, is that, is that as far as our understanding is, that is what the universe is made of. Okay? And, and that comes from many, many years of experimentation, etc. Now, one of the things I wanted to, and I'll very quickly allude to it because it's, it's, it's actually a very long and complicated um, subject. And that is, that picture I showed with all these quarks and these leptons, um, we have a theory of, of how they interact, how they work together. That theory predicts, makes predictions that you can test, and, and those predictions and those tests agree to the, 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 the 14th decimal point, and it's hard for me to, to, to emphasize how incredible that is. So our, our picture of the world, this so-called standard model, is the most precise understanding of the world that's ever happened. And we know that from measuring and comparing to these predictions. One problem is, is that all these particles in this theory have zero mass, and that's a little bit hard thing to understand as well. Um, we, and so the God particle was this particle that was, that was predicted by a man named Higgs, Peter Higgs, Scottish physicist uh, in the 60s and others, and it was, it was the way to get around this problem. Okay. Um, Leon Letterman, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics, uh, uh, who also missed his calling as a stand-up comedian, he, he, wrote a part, he wrote a book called The God Particle, which is about the Higgs particle. And ever since he wrote it, he, he, he's, he's, he's been unhappy with the fact that he used that, because now people, it gets used in movies, and people said the God particle, and then of course religion versus science comes up, and it wasn't what he meant. But in any case, it, it is the last remaining peg in our understanding of matter, and we haven't seen it yet. And um, I was going to explain what it is, but I don't think I will. But what I will say is that, is that it is the goal at the moment. It is the thing that we are all racing to find, because it is this, in some senses, as a scientist in particular, it's almost, it would almost be better if we don't find it, because then the world opens up again, and you think, ah, there's things we don't understand. But at the moment, we are trying to find it. The, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, that's one of its primary goals, is to find the Higgs boson. There's also a collider in, uh, called Fermilab outside of Chicago, which is just on the edge of possibly seeing it. And uh, of course, they would love to see it first and scoop this uh, Large Hadron Collider. And so this is a picture of the, uh, the so-called Tevatron outside Chicago, which is a one kilometer radius uh, collider. Uh, it's so much easier using metric units to describe that collider than when I go to the US. Of course, it's some number of miles around and some funny number. Um, it is a proton, anti-proton collider. So it, in and of itself, not only are we studying antimatter, we're using antimatter to study antimatter. OK, antimatter. Let's talk about antimatter. It isn't fi fiction, although it's in a fiction book. We produce it all over the world. Enough of it, in fact, could destroy Rome. And the question is, what is it? So I want to approach it by, by again, going back to E equals mc squared. There's an equal sign there. So it means that E is equal to m 
c squared. C is just, uh, it's a speed of light, it's just a constant. So basically it's saying energy is equal to mass. That's what that equation says. And we see that all the time in our, in our science. And on the right, you can see there's something we call a bubble chamber photo. And all that is is that it's a, it's a detector in which a charged particle goes through and leaves a little trail of bubbles. And you can just photograph it. And so you literally have a photograph of the trail of, of a particle. And so you can see on that picture that you have some particles go this way and some particles go that way. And it turns out that this whole thing is in a magnetic field. And if you're a positively charged particle, you go that way. And if you're a negatively charged particle, you go that way. OK? So we can tell what particles are negatively charged and which particles are positively charged. Now, I want to I concentrate and look a bit more closely at what's happening on the top left. OK? You can see that if I'm coming in, I should have had a laser pointer, I'm sorry. If I'm coming in from the, from the bottom right, there's nothing. There's, there's nothing in this picture. And what does that tell you? If there's nothing in this picture, it tells you that it's something that was uncharged, had zero, doesn't have any electric charge. Well, that's light. That's a photon, that's the particle nature of light. So it's coming in, and it transforms into a particle and an antiparticle. In this case, it transforms into an electron, which in this magnetic field curls down to the bottom, and a positron anti-electron which curls up to the top, okay? So there, there's just, there it is, right in front of your eyes, the creation of antimatter. And in fact, this is happening all the time um, in this room. It was predicted in 1928 by Paul Dirac, um, and people thought he was basically crazy, uh, but it was predicted because it just came from that very picture that I showed before. That in his theory, you have energy creates, you can't have a zero charge thing create all of a sudden an electron. You have to have a positive charge created as well. And about four years later, it was observed. Um, that picture there is again shows the track of a charged particle. And if it was a negatively charged particle, it would be going the opposite way. So that's a positively charged particle. It's a positively charged particle that looks exactly like an electron i.e. it's an anti-electron. So the world is actually composed of quarks, leptons, and anti-quarks, and anti-leptons. And that is our world, and, and the theory that we have that predicts it, predicts it with extremely a precision that, that's unparalleled. So the question is then, can we, can we make antimatter? As I said, we, we saw it created in that picture. Um, as a matter of fact, it's, 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 it's happening all the time. This is a, a Geiger counter, which, which measures charged particles going through. And I'll... Um, so we have, we have going through us all the time antimatter uh, as we sit here. Um, because Particles are, are streaming in from outer space, hitting the upper atmosphere. And in, the, in that same process, they create particles and antiparticles. They create positrons and electrons. They create protons. They create antiprotons. And those come streaming down, and they're coming through us all the time. And we're OK. You know? I mean, everybody's OK here. 